All right, so now uh, what, what I want to start on this series is the Bible doctrine of separation. And what I've been doing Wednesday nights, we've been talking about spiritual growth, and I've just been trying to help you and help myself, according to the Word of God, how to grow and be a stronger Christian. And biblical separation really goes hand in hand with spiritual growth, because when you grow spiritually, you will separate. Biblical separation is a Bible doctrine, and we're going to look at it. And it's a lesson that should be taught and needs to be taught from the pulpit. And Christians need to understand exactly what it is and what it is not. Let me just start off by saying a lot of people, when you start talking about biblical separation, they get nervous. But let me just tell you this. Biblical separation and, or let me, let me rephrase that. Separation from the world is not necessarily a mark of one's spirituality. I know a lot of Christians that are ultra separated. I mean, they will not, they will not do anything, but yet there is dead and dry the most carnal Christian. Being separated from the world does not make you spiritual, but a spiritual man or a spiritual woman will be separated because it's a Bible doctrine. All I'm saying is be very careful of judging your spirituality based on what you do and don't do. That is a Pharisee, <laughs> but that does not negate the fact of biblical separation. Hopefully you'll find out by now that I, I try to present the Bible and that the Bible speaks for itself. And typically on all issues, there's two sides of the road. There's ditches on both sides. I mean, you can have the ultra separated. And I'll, I'll just use an example of a group of people that we all would say, yeah, they're probably, they're ultra separated. It's like the Amish, right? And the Amish, most of the Amish don't even preach a pure gospel. That's why they're so ultra-separated. It's because they're working their way to heaven. It's a works-based salvation. They are so separated, they don't want the dirty Gentiles to infect them. Therefore, they will put honey on the side of the road, put a box there for you to leave your money so you're not infested by the lost people. That is ultra-separated. That is not biblical. Now, I didn't say all Amish are lost. I didn't say all Amish do that, but I'm telling you, there are some that do. They want nothing to do with the world outside of their Amish community. That's not Bible separation. On the other side of the spectrum, there, there's Christians that say, well, I'm free from sin. I can do whatever I want because I'm saved and they're so worldly. So we have to follow the Bible. So just know at the beginning of this, what you do and don't do is not a mark of your spirituality. A lot of carnal people, a lot of lost people are very separated. But again, it doesn't change the fact that we need to be separated. All right. Now, let's look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. What the Bible says here, and look at verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal pri priesthood. A holy nation, a what? A peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God called out, that's what a church is. It's a called out assembly. He called out a bunch of sinners from the world, saved them, washed them, and now you're supposed to be a peculiar people. Christians are supposed to be different. We're not supposed to look like the world. We're not supposed to walk like the world. We're not supposed to talk like the world. We're supposed to be Christians, and our mere conduct of our life should be different than those of the world because we're a peculiar people. But again, separation is not necessarily taste not, touch not. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, you have to judge all things with the final authority, which is the Word of God. Our victory, my friend, tonight does not stand in what we do or don't do. Our victory tonight is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Him and Him alone. That's where joy is found in. That's where holiness is found in. That's where peace is found in. It's all found in Jesus Christ. But look at Colossians chapter 2, and look at verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, 
after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all the principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your, in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it, to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Again, I won't uh, expound on all those verses, but what I want to show you before we move on is your victories in Christ. Your victory, Jesus Christ performed an operation of God, and now you're in him. That's where your righteousness comes from. It does not come from what you do and don't do. That is a faulty mentality. That is not a biblical mentality. It doesn't come from touch, not taste. Now read the rest of those verses there. Now look at verse 16. Knowing that Christ is our victor. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come by the body is of Christ, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Watch this. In voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. That's that voluntarily humility it's fleshly. Look what he goes on to say. Look at verse 19. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Verse 20. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as a living in the world are you subject to ordinances? If Christ, if you're dead with Christ and he's your final work, then why are you subject to ordinances? Look at verse 21. Touch not, taste not, handle not. You know what those are? Ordinances of men. And you're not subject to them because you're in Christ. He went to the cross of Calvary. He fulfilled all that for you. In him is victory, not in touch not, taste not, handle not. Those are ordinances of men. That's voluntarily humility. And look what it goes on to say, which are, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrine of men, which things have indeed, now watch this, a show of wisdom in what? Will worship. Hello, and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. You know what he said there? Those that teach and preach and will worship, touch not, taste not, handle not, that is all will worship. And again, it goes across all spectrums of Christianity. This is why, and I'll touch on this later, this is why I'm very careful. I do not give you a list of my standards. You know why? If I gave you a list of my standards, once you meet my standards, then you go home thinking you're holy, but that's the farthest thing from the truth. Because there's probably a lot in your life that you need to get right with God. It's not will worship. It's not if I do this or don't do that, I'm right with God. Now listen to me carefully. Don't misconstrue what I'm trying to tell you tonight. The Bible says you were never given liberty to sin. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is a preacher, it is not my job, and I'll just use one that I think is absolutely ridiculous, to tell some Christians they can't wear wire rim glasses. That is foolishness. That is will worship. That is touch not, taste not, handle not. There's much more things, and listen, I don't think there's anything wrong with wire rim glasses. Maybe someone does. But that is will worship. 
That is not Bible separation. That is some standards a man came up with, not the Bible. Do you see the difference? And Christians will then fall in line with this club of I don't do this so I'm right with God. And the truth is their heart's in the far country and they don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not witnessing. They're not reading their Bible. But because they don't do these things, then they're fine. That's will worship. That, my friend, is not biblical separation. Now let me say this. If God convicts you about wire rim glasses, you better not wear them. You better take them off. Because, listen... You, one of the that distinctions of Baptist doctrine, you know what it's been from the beginning of time? The priesthood of the believer. That is one of the fundamental Baptist doctrines. You are a priest before God. If God convicts you of something, you better not do it. And listen to me. There's things in my life I have liberty doing that is conviction to you. There's things in your life that you have liberty doing that are conviction to me and I would never do them. Unless it's black and white right in this Bible, that is between you and God. And there's a lot of things that are black and white in this Bible. And again, I'm not saying use what I'm saying as an excuse for sin. But we better not get caught up in will worship or standards set by men. All right? Excuse me for my little bit of cold going on. With that said, it does not change the fact the Bible is clear. We are to be separated from some things. We're to be a separated people. What are they? Look at Romans chapter 16. I'm going to show you some things the Bible lays out clearly we're supposed to be separated from. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, this is clear. There's no way around this. This is what you're supposed to be separated from. Romans 16, look at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and what? And avoid them. Someone who is causing division in the church, in your life, you better mark them and avoid them. Uh, again, I, I'm just going to say a lot of things tonight that are just not going to go well with a lot of the Baptist brethren, but I don't care because it's Bible. This mentality that when someone leaves your church, they're all of a sudden a, a Maranatha, they're accursed and they're not right with God, and that the whole church is supposed to ignore them and not make contact with them is foolishness. Amen. It is childish. And it's not Bible. They're in the body of Christ if they're saved. There's many of times when people should leave a church for different reasons. But listen to me. If that person leaves that church that you're part of and they cause problems, they cause division, they're talking bad about those people, you better mark them and avoid them because they're violating the scripture. Not because they walked out those doors, because they are causing division. That is the judgment when to break fellowship. Not because someone left your church. Sometimes people struggle. Sometimes people make bad decisions and leave for the wrong reasons. But we ought to be a people that pray for them. We ought to be a people that longs to see them back in fellowship. And listen, my prayer is this. When anyone's left this church, you know what my prayer is? Lord, bring them, guide them to another church where they can fellowship and worship Jesus Christ. I don't wish ill upon them. I don't say, Lord, get them till they come back. I say, no, Lord, get them to a church where they can serve Jesus Christ. But I am warning you, a lot of times when people leave mad, you know what they'll do? Try to take other people with them. And when someone does that, and they're trying to cause division, then you have a Bible verse where you're supposed to mark them and avoid them. You're supposed to be separated from them, not because they left your church, but because they're causing division. We won't turn there, but I'm sure you know the, what does it say, the seven things the Lord hates in Proverbs chapter 6. The last ones, them, what does it say there? Let me read it. I'm a butcher. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. If you want to, great. Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, 
a false witness that speaketh lies, and what? And he that soweth discord among brethren. That is a serious offense among God. You know why? Because we've got to be of one accord, one mind to be a strong church. And someone that will sow discord, according to the Apostle Paul, New Testament, Paulinian doctrine, you're supposed to mark them and avoid them. You know what that means? No matter where they're at, no matter if they're their friend or not, no matter if you knew them for 10 years or 20 years, someone's going to cause division, you to mark them and avoid them. All right, so that's, that's one thing, biblical separation. Let me show you another. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to show you a couple warnings here, and then I'm going to show you the conclusion, what Paul says. So the first thing for biblical separation, we're supposed to separate from those who cause division. The second group we're supposed to separate from is those who teach false doctrine, according to the Bible. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow the pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So you see these false preachers come in and what happens is these false teachers come in. Many will follow them. And this is why the Bible, the Lord uh, set up and gave a pastor is to prevent false doctrine from coming in. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Go to the left there, Galatians chapter 1. Here's Paul writing to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, look at these strong words that Paul says here. Verse 6, Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed for him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than which we have preached unto you, let him be what? Accursed. That's what Paul's saying about someone that comes in and preaches another gospel. Let him be accursed. He goes on to say, verse 9, as we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So Paul's got strong words for someone who would come in and preach another gospel. Now let's go to the right and look what he says to Titus. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Timothy Titus. So the first ones separate from those who cause division. The second ones separate from those who teach false doctrine. Titus chapter 3, look at verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Listen, you get someone, all he wants to do is debate and argue, it's unprofitable, I promise you. There's a difference in someone who wants to study and ask a sincere question about a Bible versus someone who wants to come in and cause trouble. And look what he says there, uh, the following verse in verse 10. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, what? Reject. See, there's some people you're supposed to reject out of your life. There's some people after you try to plead with them and tell them the truth, you're supposed to separate unto because many will follow that false teaching. So biblical separation is separated from those who cause division. Biblical separation is to separate them from them that teach false doctrine. Biblical separation is also to be separated from the lost. Look at 2 Corinthians. Go to the left. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter six, look at verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14, Paul writing to the church. He says, "Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? 
Listen to me, I understand. Remember I told you the Bible is, is like honey? It's sweet in your mouth and bitter in your belly? Everything isn't pleasant, everything we don't like. A Christian has no business dating a lost person. It's, they're not supposed to be unequally yoked with them. And when they do, they're ignoring the commandment of God. It will lead to serious things. They ought not to do it. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Look at verse 15. He goes on to say, What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath, he, hath the believer with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Look back there and look what he says, verse 14. He says, be ye not unequally together with unbelievers, right? He classifies them as unbelievers. And then what does he say there in verse 17? Wherefore, come out from among them and be what? Separate. We are supposed to be separate from the unbelievers. We are to be a called out assembly different. And our relationships in our life should not be consumed with unbelievers. Now, obviously, you have to take the whole Bible into account. I'm not telling you to, again, to be Amish and be so isolated that you can't reach them. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. He had compassion on the lost. He was accused of uh, drinking and eating with what? Drunkards and wives because he went to reach them. I'm not telling you to reach them. But listen to me. If in hard times you pick up the phone and your best friend's a lost man and you're getting counsel from a lost man, you're not right with God. That's not what I'm talking about. There's a balance there. Who you spend your weekends with, week after week after week after week in fellowship with, if it's a lost man or a lost man, that is not right with God. I'm not telling you, again, never go out and try to reach them. I'm not telling you not to go out and help them. I'm not telling you to don't spend time with them. I'm talking about your relationships. The one you're dating, the one you're marrying, the one you, that you trust for wisdom and counsel. That not, ought not be the lost world. That's being unequally yoked together with them. There's a difference. Now, we won't turn there. Obviously, you've read in the Gospels where Jesus Christ said the very same thing, and he went to the publicans. He went to the sinners. He went to the drunkards. So I'm not talking to you so ultrally separated where you can't talk to them or witness to them. But you better make sure that's not your best friend or the one you're in a relationship with or the one you're seeking counsel from. We're supposed to be called out from them. Again, I want to get through some other things, but you, you remember the story in Daniel chapter 1, right? You know what Daniel refused to do? He refused to defile himself with what? The king's meat and wine. He said, nope, I won't defile myself with that stuff. He was separated unto God. See, biblical separation is being separated from the lost world. We are Christians. We are peculiar people, and we're supposed to be separated. Again, separation is about holiness. It's about being a vessel, meat for the master's use. Let me show you another thing we're supposed to be separated from. Look at 1 John chapter 2. Not only from this lost world, we're supposed to be separated from worldliness. Look at 1 John. First John chapter 2. Verse 15, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Listen, Christian, you better be separated from this world. And that has to do with your heart. That has to do with your affections. That has to do with the things you love. You know what the problem with so many Christians are? They're so worldly, there's no difference between them and their lost neighbor. I'm talking about what they desire. They can't wait to get off work to what? To sit down and watch that baseball game that's on. They can't wait for the weekend to come because they got to head to the cabin. Listen, in those things, there's nothing wrong 
with some of that stuff. There is wrong with some of it. But I'm just saying there's nothing wrong with some of it, but where's your heart? You're supposed to be separated from the world. By the way, the world in the Bible is not the earth. What I'm saying is God has given you life and he's given you abundantly. There is nothing wrong with walking outside, seeing God's beauty and say, thank you, Lord. This is a beautiful earth we live in. The world is about the world system, its attraction, its pull, being worldly, leaving God out. Enjoy your life. I'm not telling you not to enjoy it. But I'm saying, where's your heart? Where's your affection? Many Christians are so worldly. You know when they think of church? Sunday morning when the alarm goes off. You know when they read their Bible, when the pastor says, open your Bible and read this passage. Because they're so worldly. And they're consumed by the things of this world. We as Christians, biblical separation is being separated from this world. From the love of the world. The lust of this world. And falling in love with Jesus Christ. All right, we could talk about worldliness all day. It's really easy, but we'll move on. Not only should we be separated from worldliness, the Bible commands us to be separated from the backslidden. But a lot of Christians don't know that. Look at 2 Thessalonians. Go to the left. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Watch this now, what Paul's writing here, verse 6, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you what? Withdraw yourselves from every what? Brother, it's not the lost person, from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the traditions which you received of us. For yourselves know, know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. You know what? Just because someone's saved and just because they're a Christian doesn't mean they're a good friend for you. And when there's a disorderly Christian, you're supposed to separate yourself from that brother or that sister. You need to get away from them. This is separation from a Christian who walks disorderly, who's got a, who, who, who will do things that a Christian would not do. You need to separate yourself from, from that brother. Look at uh, verse 14. Verse 14. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have what? No company with him that he may be ashamed. Ye count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. There is times when the best thing that a Christian can do is have no fellowship with that brother. Again, I touched on it, and we won't turn there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is a perfect example. When that case of fornication is happening in, in 1 Corinthians, you know what Paul says? Put him out. Kick him out of your church. Mark him. He's walking disorderly. Why? You want him to know that what he's doing is not right. And then he should be ashamed. And then what? Repent. In 2 Corinthians, you take him back into the house of God once he's repented and gotten right. That's why you don't treat him as an enemy. But there's a general application to that too. When it comes to your friends who you make and hang out with, if they're disorderly, if they blaspheme the name of God, if they do things that would bring a reproach to your Savior, you're supposed to mark them and avoid them. You say, why? Because we're supposed to be separated. We're supposed to be a holy people, one that God can use for his glory, biblical separation. I won't, we won't turn there, I'll just quote it to you, but 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. You know who that applies to? Not just the lost world. That applies to Christians too. When they have evil communications, they will corrupt good manners. And that's why you're supposed to avoid them, mark them. So let me, let me just say this as we progress on. Biblical separation is not legalism. Biblical separation is holiness. And the Bible demands holiness. The Bible demands a clean vessel, meat for the master's use. Don't mis mistake what I'm saying tonight. You better be holy before God. You better be cleaned up before God because he demands it. Biblical separation. All right, so what... Uh, 
Look at um, look at Romans chapter one. That train of thought there was First Peter chapter one, but I want you to turn to Romans one because it is written, "Be holy, for I am holy." That's what God wants from you. That's what He wants from me. A holy and clean life, so He can use us. All right. Now, also, want, I think this is a very important point in regards to separation. Separation for the Christian, although hopefully you've seen tonight, is cleaning up your life, is separating from people that are not holy, is, is, is cleaning up so God can use you. But listen to me, if you miss this point, you, you won't make it in the Christian life. Separation is not just getting rid of some things, but it's substituting with those old wicked things you do with something new and holy. See, there, you have your old lifestyle. And you were doing all these wicked things. If you just cut them out, you know what's there? A big void. That's why when you're separated, biblical separation is just not removal of something, but it's separated unto something. You're replacing that wicked life with a holy life. Instead of going to bars on Friday, now you're passing out tracts on Friday. See, it's separated unto something. Just not getting rid of things. Look at Romans chapter 1 there. Biblical separation, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated what? Unto the gospel of God. My friend, that's biblical separation. You get that old stuff out and you start serving the Lord Jesus Christ with your life. That's how you'll make it. You know what will happen then? The things of this world will grow strangely dim. You'll lose your, your love for all those things you used to love. Now you're separated unto the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, look at verse 1. I would say this would be my conclusion of this, even though we got a couple more verses, but this is what I want you to take away about biblical separation. Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, what? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is reasonable for you to know that God demands a holy vessel. It is reasonable for you to clean up your life for the Lord Jesus Christ after all he did for you. It is reasonable for you to strive to be holy so God can use you. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. But here's the replacement. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which that excuse me what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God see it's not just not being conformed it's also about being transformed it's about replacing that wicked life with a holy life it's about no longer living for me but living for the Lord Jesus Christ that is biblical separation and when you will walk in light of the scripture, wanting to please him because you love him, I promise you it'll be real easy to get those things out of your life that shouldn't be there. You won't have to say, preacher, is this okay? Like I've said before, I don't have to ask you, is eating a salad okay? You know what I might have to say? Doctor, is okay if I have six bowls of ice cream? You know why I have to ask that? Because I know it's not okay. If you have to ask, is it okay? My friend, it's not okay. Holiness is pure. Holiness is light. And God demands a pure and holy people. I just refuse to tell you my standards because I don't want you to live to my standards. I want you to live to God's standards. And he's got a whole lot more standards than I do. And my friend, biblical separation is a Bible doctrine. We live in a very carnal, carnal, carnal world. We're Christians. Every Christian is saved. I get it, saved. And not only that, every Christian is right with God. Their relationship is perfect. Their, their fellowship is perfect. Their lives is perfect. But you know what the truth is? They need to read Romans chapter 1 again. You know, Romans chapter 1, 
It's not just a, a, a condemnation of the wicked. You better read it real carefully. It says, in them that take pleasure, in them that do them. You know, I know a lot of Christians that take pleasure in wickedness. Sit behind that TV. Would never let a sodomite in their house, but they'll let it in through the television. And they'll sit back and laugh at that show. They would never let adultery into their home, but they'll sit back and take pleasure in it on the television. They would never let the things into their home, but for some reason, they take pleasure in those things. They get joy from those things. And my friend, that is not a separated holy life unto God. Read Romans chapter 1. The condemnation is just not about them that do them, but it's also towards them that take pleasure in them that do them. I told you, I preached on this several years ago. I can't stand the, these, uh, these TV shows that exploit and make tons of money off these missing children. There's nothing more sickening, Nancy Grace and her TV show and the rest of that foolishness. There's no pleasure in that. Why am I going to sit and watch that filth and discussing what happened to that child? Are you kidding me? And the TV is filled with it. And you know what Christians do? Night after night after night after night after night, they take pleasure in those things. And I'm telling you, we need to examine our lives because if we're going to serve God with power and be consumed by God, he demands holiness because he's a holy God. And you better make sure your life's clean. I will leave you with these warnings. We won't turn there in Judges, but I'll read you a few verses. Isaiah chapter 5 says this, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. They got it all figured out. They're wise in their own eyes. Oh, they, they don't need any counsel. They don't need any reproof. They, they got their life figured out. The Bible says, woe unto them. Proverbs chapter 30 says, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet they are not washed from their filthiness. They're pure. <laughs> That's the Christians. I'm pure. But the truth is they're not washed from their own filthiness. Last verse, Proverbs chapter 14 there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. My friend, I'm just telling you, and I'm trying to encourage you tonight, you should examine your own life and what we do and the things we say and where we go and everything about our life should be for honor and glory to our Savior. Everything about our life because he demands holiness. And in demanding holiness, if you want to see God, we have to live a clean life. But just don't think the blessings of God come by what you do and don't do. It's about falling in love with Jesus Christ and following him wholly. And so, Lord, search my heart. Make me clean. And whatever's in my life that needs to be cleaned out, Lord, take it out. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I know I was kind of all over the board tonight and all over different things. And Lord, I pray that the words that I said, I pray that the word of God that was spoken tonight would reach Christians. I pray that it would touch their hearts. And Lord, I know just in my own life, I often have to work out my own salvation, as you said. I often have to re-examine my life and say, Lord, what's not holy? What's unclean? Lord, take it out. God, I pray that we'd be a balanced people that we would see that the blessings of God come from the Lord Jesus Christ. That we wouldn't become Pharisees, but we would strive to be holy. God, I pray that you'd bless tonight. Bless your word and bless your people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.